Welcome to this single salt analysis tutorial. My name is Wendy Bacon. I am a lecturer at The Open University as well as a visiting researcher at Emble EBI. This tutorial I'm going to do on the Human Cell Atlas Galaxy Instance. It should function on most Galaxy Instances that I know of, and if not, try galaxy.eu or galaxy.org. I'm only using the Human Cell Atlas one because it's the first one I ever use, so it's my favorite. This tutorial is not going to be explaining a lot to the science, it's just going to be as a tool or a resource for you to be able to follow along, get your right parameters. If anything is going wrong, you're not sure where to click or what to do, hopefully watching this tutorial will help you. For any of the scientific content, please read the tutorial itself. That is gonna be your home for the information. Okay, so we start with getting data. And you can either use the input history uh, and then import it or I'm going to uh, import the add data object that was made in the previous tutorial. So this can sometimes take a while, so I'm gonna copy the link to that input history. And I'm just going to import that. Cool. Okay. Rename of the history. And then make sure, is it H5AD? Yes, it is. As part of the first question, you might be inspecting the end data object. And again, if you're using the tutorial version, you can just, you can just click. So I can just click on that and then I'm sorted. And then I want to do that a few more times. I want to see the OVs and the Gs. Okay, and then we can look at all sorts of our lovely information. Okay, and then we're gonna plot the keys over and I want to do the same thing again and then finally for batch And then I'm going to make some scatter plots. I'm just copying and pasting from the tutorial. And I mean, you can pretty much use anything in your OBS information. This, I just think, came out the cleanest in terms of being able to visualize on this data set because it's quite a messy data set. So it, it helps clarify where you might want to put your filters, etc. Okay, and then we're naming our, our plots. just for easy access because you end up with quite a lot of plots on here. All right, well, now we have all the plots in the world. Whew. 
and you can also, if you want, you can enable a scratch book and then you can sort of look at the plots. And you can resize that. You can look at the plot side by side. So if I then click off this and then I also have that, well now I can sort of look at the two plots at the same time and that's quite handy when you're using Scratchbook. So that's a little, enable, a little handy uh, utility within Galaxy. Okay, and then you're gonna be given lots of different questions um, to analyze the, what's going on in each of the plots. And then it's time to apply the filters. So. Very easy to accidentally hit the surat on here, by the way, when you're searching, so make sure you don't do that. And I'm gonna do the standard. And we, the, there are a few that automatically come up. We're not using those because it's less clear because the data is quite messy. So I do that. Oh, oh, I see, I'm gonna plot next. We're looking at genotype just because that's our most important variable. <laughs> to be fair, you want all the variables to be as similar as possible um, in terms of like sequencing depth and output. So that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're setting up. And then I'm going to inspect. And this is quite cool because even if you examine it, you can see right here without even having to do an inspect step, um, the uh, cells and the genes that are left. And then you can compare that with the original, right, which had a lot more cells, but the same number of genes. So you can look at this and see each of your different parameters and what's happened. You can compare it with the previous one and say, oh, look at these different batches. How cool is that? Um, I think actually the best way to set this up right now is to say we want phylin genotype. So I'm going to enable Scratchbook, phylin by genotype. All right, and then I also want this violin as well so I can see what's changed um, so you can look and see oh, that's not really done anything <laughs> let's look over here and we can see now we're seeing a much more significant change because that's what we were filtering by we've sort of done a cut off of this bottom for better for worse all right and then now we're going to filter total counts as opposed to gene counts so I'm just going to cheat redo this step. I want to filter by total counts rather than the log log 1p of gene counts. And we're going to go with 6.3. It'll always be higher than your genes because you are expecting to have multiple copies of a transcript. Well, not copies, not PCR amplicons rather, but copies that the cell has made. It should have more than one transcript of a given expressed gene. So you would want to put your cutoff higher. And then we repeat our plot. <laughs> when I'm so zoomed in, there's a lot more effort to do <laughs> these sort of repeat steps. All right, and we're there again. So I will rename everything. I know it's a little bit of a faff to rename everything all the time. This is going to be a long tutorial. 
And it can be so confusing when you're using the same tools over and over again, which we are. A lot of the single cell tools have a lot of stuff packed into them, a lot of abilities packed into them. And it can be so confusing when you're looking back. So the more you can get in the habit of managing your data well, the better your life will be. So do it. Okay, and then I'll add this filter by counts in. And now I can actually, using my scratch book, see each phase of filtering and what happens. This is not a great look, if I'm honest. <laughs> to be frank, this is a better look because you can at least see the bottom of the violin plot, which is a lot better. Uh, but we, you know, this is, I'm putting in quite low cutoffs. So I'm being very liberal with my cutoffs, is how I would put it, uh, to keep as much as I can because I know the data's messy and there was a lot of background. Okay, and now that we've done by G or by genes per cell, by counts per cell, or you know the log versions of it, we're going to do the same thing with percent counts mito. So we know that mitochondrial RNA etc. is a sign of stress, and we don't want to keep our stressed out, angry, half dead cells. So we're gonna filter out our. Oh, well, this is easier. Just do that. And 5% is pretty standard, always, you know, read the text, it depends, depends on the sample that you're working with. But we're going to go with 4.5 today, just to be a bit contrary, really. I always think the ultimate test of your data is how well it survives weird analyses. And as always, relabeling. And then we can again look at all of our plots. One, two, three. Okay, and the last step we're gonna do is filtering genes. Now, the first time I ran this protocol, I got a bit lackadaisical and thought, ooh, it probably doesn't matter the order in which I do these steps. Filtering's filtering, right? No big deal. So I went rogue. I went rogue and I did the filter gene step first, like a fool. And basically this means that later on you end up with a whole bunch of genes in your, once you filter out all these cells, you'll end up with a bunch of genes that don't have any cells associated with them. So you have these like empty columns in your data set. And later on, much later on, a bunch of the tools will break because I can't handle the fact that some genes have nothing in them. So don't make that my mistake and filter genes first. Make sure you do all of your filtering and then hit filter genes. I always love making these videos because making the videos takes, you know, as long as it takes you guys to get through the tutorial. But then the final video output at the end, when you edit out all of the time of waiting for stuff, um, is much shorter and it seems so efficient. <laughs> so if, if steps are taking longer than you're seeing in the video, it's because I edit out all of the other time waiting. All right, onward with the process. You know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, if I search scamp it here, usually, um, It'll be a lot easier for me to find all the stuff that I want. Although, if you're using the tutorial mode, then you're pretty much good to go. Okay, normalizing some data. Yes, number 20. Let's do that. And then I'm just going to set up the next one because it's kind of a sequence of pretty standardized, mostly, steps. Although, there's a whole bunch of parameters here you could change if you wish. Okay, and then scale data, trunk it to 10. And then we're going to run PCA. So this is our first, well, I guess find variable genes, you're also downsampling a bit. Uh, but now we're properly 
um, going to start reducing the size of our data, reducing the dimensions. I always double check the inputs on this because you end up with quite a big history. So I do, I do recommend that. I want that. And we use 50, so we'll show 50. Okay, and I will rename that. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's a wonderful sunny day. Some lovely birds singing in the background, mocking me. Uh, all right. And then you can decide, ooh, where do I want to put my cutoff? How exciting. Okay, onto our compute graph. Oh, bad, bad, bad. No space, no space. All right, so this is where we're defining our nearest neighbor graph and trying to put everything on like a single graph as opposed to a thousand and one dimensions. Okay, um, let's just check. I want 15 neighbors. Sure. And then the number of PCs, we're going to use 20, because that's what we've determined from the previous plot. Or at least such is what we think. And then we can also do a bit of get the rest of our plots calculated, right? So different ways of reducing dimensions, different um, places you're going to be on your XY graph. Oh, perplexity. Yeah, so perplexity will be 30, but you can change it if you're working in a group. Yeah, and it is working on 29. And we also want run UMAP. These other ones, Paga and RunFTP, are more looking at trajectories. Um, so that's a separate tutorial, the next one, in fact, if you're following along. So now we have our lovely UMAP. So we're not going to get any pretty plots out of this yet because it's just calculating the coordinates. All right. And now with those coordinates, we can now try and calculate, all right, if those things are quite next to each other on this nearest graph, what's the likelihood that they're a cluster? Let's start calling some clusters. And we'll use the Louvain. Lots of people now are using Leiden. And we're going to use a resolution because I know this data set and it's not the cleanest. We don't want to make too many clusters because we're the more detail you have per cell, the more you can trust, the more clusters is what I would say. But it also depends on your sample. If it's a super homogeneous set, then you also don't want to be calling a whole bunch of clusters where there are not. So you kind of have to take a few things into account on your cluster calling. All right, we have our lovely clusters. So let's now do the fun bit, which is figure out why a cluster is a cluster. So let's look at the genes that uh, make it so. So sometimes you just need to hit that. I don't know if that glitch has been fixed yet, but for whatever reason, you do need to click that sometimes. Loads of parameters you can change there. So it will sort of automatically make clusters by Louvain clustering. We might also be interested in if there are any differences across genotype. And then, you know, the manipulate and data tool could let you filter out specific clusters. So then you could just compare those to each other. Like there's a lot of fun that you can have with the fine markers to compare different things. Okay, and again, this is actually particularly important. You want to make sure uh, that you relabel these things appropriately you've got four things that look like fine markers and the other side of this is it will store the result of your fine markers within the object oh I've just done that wrong Oops. Okay. it will store that information within the object and we are more interested in yeah so here's your marker table and this is well, I guess this we're more interested in the cluster comparisons rather than the genotype because the genotype is sort of like glorified bulk RNA seq because you're just smashing everything together. So I'll just I'll I'm gonna just get rid of that one so that I keep my final object. 
Uh, anyway, you want to, so yeah, you want to keep stored within your end data object the results of the comparisons between clusters. All right. Now we're going to do a little jiggery pokery. Final object, and I want variable information. Right, so we want this information because if you look at it, oh, it has the ensemble ID, uh, which is the most accurate way of counting transcripts, but the symbols are really what we're going to be talking about when we're trying to understand it from the logical point of view. And right now, our lovely cluster and genotype uh, tables, they only have the ensemble ID as their label. So we're going to do a bit of jiggery pokery to <laughs> make that work. Want join two data sets side by side. I want to specify a field. And their column four is the one that has that ensemble ID. Yes, that's what we want. And column two. It's yes, yes, no, yes. Now, at this point, I strongly recommend checking because sometimes the order will be a little bit bizarre. So you just want to make sure you have the right number. All right, and then I want to rename these tables. Should have genes and then symbol awesome. And I know that it's the shorter one. It's going to be when you're splodging everything together. It's going to be when you're comparing across genotype. Really the, imp the most interesting one is when it's by cluster. All right. You know what? Just for my own peace of mind, I'm just gonna do that. I'm gonna hide them, <laughs> and I'll I have a nice tape, uh, a nice history. And now the best bit of all, it's time to plot. That's where we get to see all of our lovely hard work. Yes, final object. Oh yes. We're going to start with PCA <laughs> using our predefined knowledge. We're going to be plotting by a whole bunch of different things. Lots of different bits and bobs for changing how your plot looks, essentially. And then I'm going to do the same thing for Tisney. And view map. No. Auto correct, mocking me. And we're there. Oh, there's buckets and buckets of information you can now get from these images. It would help if I zoomed out a bit. <laughs> All right, so buckets and buckets of information that you can analyze and think about and interpret, and I strongly recommend that you do. That you know, the more sort of t time you spend trying to get into the mind of why might you want these plots, what might they be telling you, uh, the more easily you'll be able to direct your questions, direct your analysis. Uh, yeah, but we're going to move on to the annotating clusters step. We're going to rename our categories. We've cunningly been able to figure out exactly what each cluster is, looking at their marker tables and our known marker genes. And so rather than have them be named cluster zero, we're going to give them their actual 
name names, cell type name, and then we don't want to necessarily delete that. Especially, you know, if you look at the marker table, it will be cluster zero or cluster one. So it would be nice. Although I suppose you could just run the marker table again using the new categories and that would work too. Um, we'll just add them back in as well. So now we're copying that cluster annotation back into your original object. And then that means we essentially have Louvain and Louvain underscore zero. So that's not ideal. And now it's called Louvain zero and we don't really want that. Actually, I'm gonna get a fresh one so I don't accidentally repeat the same thing again. So we don't want it to be called Louvain. Louvain. We want it to be called cell type. So this second Louvain category is getting changed. There we go. And now we have Louvain and cell type. Uh, so that's a lot nicer. So we're gonna rename this our final cell annotated object. <laughs> so if we want to now plot that so that we get our lovely labels, we can rerun one of these and just run it on the final object. And then we can add in cell type. Or you can switch Louvain to cell type, it'll color it the same way, it'll just label it differently. And now if we look at the plot, it's labeled by cell type rather than number, and that's cool. And there's whole heaps of information again across all of these different plots and what you can interpret, so please do take some time and do that. The last bit is when we're looking at some of our interactive visualization. And so if we go over here to our UCSC cell browser, um, we'll choose the format, so it's Scampa, that's what we've been using. Yes, a final annotated object, sure, sure. Yeah, Louvain is fine. We can execute that. And we're up and running. So now I can hit view data. Oh, I've zoomed far too far in. <laughs> there we go. Okay, and then, oh, this is brilliant. And it's something you're gonna wanna spend some time playing around with. You can look at all sorts of different visualizations. Um, you can color by different things. Yeah, now we're coloring by genotype, you can color by batch. Uh, yeah, you can, it's, it's a lovely thing to mess around with and to be able to interrogate your data. So spend a bit of time mucking around with seeing all the wonderful things you can do in this. It's also nice because you can just share your history and someone can immediately click on this and start playing around in it just the same way you were, which is awesome. All right, yeah, we're gonna just do that. All right, and it's finally changed to, I'm ready, so I'll click here to display. And this is going to take you into, ugh, it always makes me do this. Um, that's fine. The interactive viewers, for whatever reason, always catch out my uh, security stuff. No, well, I will find sometimes, if this happens to you and it says proxy target missing, I don't know why it glitches this way. It is, I, I promise it's worth the pain, okay? Um, just run it again and then leave it for a few minutes before trying to look at it. As I said, if this plays you up or if it says proxy target missing or something, just exit, leave it for a minute and then come back and do it again and then leave it for like five minutes. And then usually you'll get this happen, uh, which is pretty great, so. Cool, 
this is a whole world to explore, if I'm honest. There's all sorts of cool things you can do with it. Like, okay, I want, you know, I want to color it by batch. I want to color it by cell type or genotype. Right. Ooh, ooh, that's this is interesting when you color it by genotype. And then now I've created a little population and I can click it. There's all sorts of wicked stuff you can do to explore. And this is just nice because it means you're exploring your data without having to recreate plots left, right, and center. And then you can kind of pick which plots show what you're looking at and what you can investigate. And it, it's just a really nice exploration tool when you're trying to interpret your data. All right, and then just make sure to come here and hit stop when you're done looking through that tool. And that brings us to the end of this tutorial, so I hope you had a great time!